Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Alexander DeSanctis of National Review, who is in for Jim Garrity today and tomorrow, for that matter. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have, what do we have? We have three crazy martinis, plus Alexandra's inside look at two of the Senate seats that flipped because she covered them very closely over the course of the midterm election campaign. Those will be the Senate seats in North Dakota and Indiana. We'll get to those towards the end of our podcast today. And Alexandra, I'm thrilled that we have a slow news day for you here today. This is unbelievable. We're not even going to talk much about some of the major stories happening. Uh, We've got, of course, the horrific shooting out in Thousand Oaks, California, with uh, at least a dozen people dead. Uh, We're going to let the the details come to light about that. We've got families grieving. We're not going to jump in and pile on with the politics and that aspect of it. In today's podcast, uh, we've also got the resignation slash firing of Jeff Sessions, which didn't even make the final cut today. And so let's dive in with our first crazy. And that goes to yesterday's press conference. I also naively said yesterday as we were recording just as the press conference was beginning that let's hope the president doesn't make a whole lot of news in this press conference. So that way our podcast is still up to date. Well, no surprise that didn't come true. And the crazy martini from the press conference is not even the fact that he trashed the losing members of his own party who didn't who didn't win their elections on midterm election night. Instead, uh, the headline out of this is the dust up between the president and CNN White House correspondent Jim Acosta. Uh, Three cuts just to set the stage. I'm sure most of you are aware of this. But uh, here's uh, Acosta when he first took the mic. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to challenge you on on one of the statements that you made in the tail end of the campaign. Uh, in, in the midterms. That here, this, here we go. That, well, if Let's you don't go. mind, Let's Mr. President, Come on. that this caravan was an invasion. As you know, I, Ms. President, I consider it to be an invasion. As you know, Mr. President, the caravan was not an invasion. It's a, it's a, a group of migrants moving up from Central America towards the border with the U.S. Thank you for telling and me that. And why, why, did you, why did you characterize it as such? Uh, because I consider it an invasion. You and I have a difference of opinion. But do you think that you demonized immigrants in not this election no, not to try I to want keep them, I want them to come into the country, but they have to come in legally. You know, they have to come in, Jim, through a process. So Acosta says, why do you call it an invasion? Trump says, because I think it is an invasion. Acosta says, no, it's not an invasion. And then it uh, got even worse later. And here's uh, the altercation that involved the microphone and the intern trying to grab it after Trump said Acosta was done. Here's the whole exchange. They're hundreds of miles away, though. They're hundreds and hundreds of you miles away. That, that's I not an invasion. Should, honestly... Uh, I think you should let me run the country. You run CNN. All right. And if you did it well, your ratings well, let me would be ask, much better. If I, if I may okay, ask one enough. other question, Mr. President, if I may, if I may no, ask Peter, one other ahead. question, are you worried? Of, that's enough. That's no, enough. Mr. President, I, well, that's I was going to ask one of the, the other folks. That's had, enough. Pardon me, ma'am. I'm, I'm, Mr. Excuse President, me. That's enough. Mr. President, I had one other Peter, question, if I may ask, on, on the Russia investigation. Are you concerned that... That you may have I'm not concerned about anything with you the may Russian investigation because it's a hoax. Are you, That's enough. Put down the mic. Mr. President, are you worried about indictments coming down in this investigation? Mr. President. I'll tell you what, CNN should be ashamed of itself having you working for them. You are a rude, terrible person. You shouldn't be working for CNN. Go ahead. I, I think that's unfair. You're a very rude person. The way you treat Sarah Huckabee is horrible. And the way you treat other people are horrible. You shouldn't treat people that way. Go ahead. We're not done yet. Peter Alexander of NBC was next. And uh, Jim Acosta, even without the mic, uh, still wasn't done. You repeatedly you said... Aren't, you aren't the best. Mr. President, you repeatedly, o- over the course okay, of... Okay, just sit down, please. Well, when you, when you report fake news, no. When you report fake news, which CNN does a lot, you are the enemy of the people. Go ahead. Mr. President... So in case you couldn't hear, Jim Acosta was basically linking the president to the pipe bomber. And so then last night we got this series of tweets from Sarah Sanders. President Trump believes in a free press and expects and welcomes tough questions of him and his administration. We will, however, never tolerate a reporter placing his hands on a young woman just trying to do her job as a White House intern. This conduct is absolutely unacceptable. It is also completely disrespectful to the reporter's colleagues not to allow them an opportunity to ask a question. President Trump has given the press more access than any president in history. Contrary to CNN's assertions, there is no greater demonstration of the president's support for a free press than the event he held today. Only they would attack the president for not supporting a free press in the midst of him taking 68 questions from 35 different reporters. 
over the course of an hour and a half, including several from the reporter in question. The fact that CNN is proud of the way their employee behaved is not only disgusting, it's an example of their outrageous disregard for everyone, including young women who work in this administration. As a result of today's incident, the White House is suspending the hard pass of the reporter involved until further notice. CNN, of course, uh, issuing a a statement in response saying that this was a, a threat to our democracy and so forth. So... Alexandra, essentially, we've got two massive egos here. You've got uh, Acosta thinking he's up there to debate the president rather than ask questions of the president. The president, of course, can't resist calling him a horrible, terrible person and all this stuff. And, and ultimately, it's now a, a debate over the free press when CNN's got plenty of other people who can cover the White House. But the, the White House probably went too far here. Uh, what do you make of this, <laughs> of this standoff between the president and Jim Acosta? Once again, I'm left wondering, is it possible to dislike absolutely everybody involved in an incident and to think that they're all wrong in totally unique ways? I mean, (laughs) looking at this incident, clearly Trump is unpresidential. He could have handled that. You know, I think you can shut down a reporter behaving in that way. Acosta was over the line. He was debating the president rather than asking a question. And I think the first fault is with him. But if you're the president, you know, I picture Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz up there. There's a way to push back against that. That's not, you know, insulting him and calling him a rude, terrible person. But at the same time, I don't disagree with that characterization. And I think Jim Acosta has been cruising for a bruising in there for a long time. This is the kind of stunt he always pulls. And he's clearly angling for a TV show and he's not behaving like a reporter. He's behaving like a pundit who's in there, you know, um, to challenge the president every time he says something that CNN doesn't think is true. So I, I certainly don't think it's a threat to the First Amendment that his press pass was revoked. I think that there's every reason to think that I'm not going to get into litigating the video and what did he attack this intern did he put his hands on her i don't i don't really want to go down that road of trying to you know (laughs) sort out those details but clearly this is not the kind of behavior i would expect from the press no that's clearly the case and uh acosta and trump both love this Uh, you know acosta is out there acting of course like the aggrieved victim here uh but he loves this he loves the attention he he's he's a total grandstander in the press room and at the same time the president could probably get a lot of public sympathy uh, just by letting Acosta be Acosta, but instead he needs to take this step, which is only making the blowback come in his direction as well. Right. Once again, I mean, Trump and the media feed off each other. It's this vicious cycle. And if one would just give up, things would get a lot better. And I pr- would prefer it to be Trump because I think the media, much of the mainstream media, is disgraceful in the way they cover him. And if he could just not be insane with this rhetoric once in a while, he would win every single time. Another member of the media is Tucker Carlson. He hosts a primetime show on the Fox News channel, as most people know, certainly those who listen to this podcast. And uh, he wasn't home last night, but his wife was when a bunch of Antifa people showed up. And these uh, people, I think they call themselves Smash Racism DC, decided to be a really good idea to videotape their demonstration outside Tucker Carlson's home with all their crazy chants. His wife, apparently, Tucker Carlson's wife, locked herself in the pantry and called 911. Uh, but here is uh, a, a montage of different clips. I'll translate them if it's the audio is not clear. We know where you sleep at night. We know where you sleep at night. Tucker Carlson, we will fight. We know where you sleep at night. And then here's uh, what Antifa ultimately wants. No wall. No USA at all. No borders, no wall, no USA at all. And finally this. Racist scumbag leave town. So, uh, you know, this is just the continuation, Alexandra, of getting their face no matter where they are. It used to at least be in public. Gas stations, restaurants, the mall, whatever, whatever Maxine Waters said. Now they're going to people's houses. Uh, This is getting pretty creepy real fast. Oh, it's horrifying. And obviously this is not on the same level as the, you know, so-called MAGA bomber who is mailing the pipe bombs to Democrats. But it's all part and parcel of one incredibly toxic political climate in which, you know, the end always justifies the means. And if you have a particular political goal in mind and the other side isn't going along with it, anything is justified, any kind of bullying, any kind of targeting becomes justified in order to get what you want because, you know, the grand goal and the grand scheme is to to get your agenda through for the good of the country. And instead, it becomes bullying people's wives so that they have to hide in their pantry. I mean, if that's where we're headed, we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, no, that's uh, unbelievable that this is 
allowed to happen. I, I don't know exactly what happened when the police came. I do know that the group has taken down the videos from their website. But, of course, on the Internet and on Twitter, everything lives forever. So um, we know what they did, and uh, it, it's out there for everyone to see. Very, very frightening. Uh, for for Tucker Carlson's wife. She's not the one who hosts the TV show, but these people don't care. Uh, They'll take on anybody who gets in their path, and it's it's very, very chilling. All right, let's move on to our third crazy martini now. And, of course, midterm election day was Tuesday. We've got a decent number of uh, exit polls. Who knows if they got the sampling right, but uh, ultimately, and if the people told the truth to the exit pollsters. But here's some of what we think we know. Among white women... 76% of white women in Georgia voted for Brian Kemp for governor. 59% of white women in Texas voted for Ted Cruz for Senate. And 51% of white women in Florida voted for Ron DeSantis uh, for governor there. Among black women, 95% voted for uh, Beta O'Rourke in Texas, the Senate race against Ted Cruz. 97% voted for Stacey Abrams in Georgia. 82% uh, voting for Gillum in Florida. Uh, So people are obviously upset that white women aren't doing what they think white women should be doing in the polls. And that's voting for, I don't know, pro-choice because they're women or or just they, they ought to be liberal for some reason. So the Women's March uh, finds that information and then they tweet, there needs to be an accountability and an honest reckoning. There's a lot of work to do, white women, a lot of learning, a lot of growing. We want to do it with you. Stay tuned. So I thought they spoke for all women, Alexandra. What's going on here? They don't seem very happy with all women right now. This is one of the most, perhaps the most frustrating uh, line of commentary to come out of midterm elections. And this is, it's not just Women's March. This is most progressive commentary is centered around this idea that white women are the problem. And if Democrats lose anywhere, it's because white women aren't sufficiently indoctrinated to the way all women are supposed to be voting, which is obviously the progressive way. But I've been pointing this out a lot, and I intend to continue talking about it all the time, because there's this incredibly fundamental tension between this identity politics idea of women must be liberal and the idea of feminism, which is women have autonomy and can be trusted to think for themselves and presumably vote, vote based on their belief system, which is not necessarily always embracing the entire progressive agenda. So I think, you know, the left's kind of embrace of identity politics right now is honestly kind of eating feminism alive. And um, it's a problem for sure. And the way that they're demonizing white women and just conservative women in general is extremely frustrating to me. Well, we saw a lot of this after the 2016 election as well. You had Michelle Obama, even Hillary Clinton herself, saying that women were voting the way they did. A lot of white women because they just did whatever their husbands told them to do. And now basically we're seeing the same type of commentary here that uh, women, especially I think in the South or in evangelical families, supposedly uh, have no minds of their own. Uh, They just want to make their husbands happy. uh, And that's why they're voting the way they are, not because they have principled beliefs on on liberty and and, and, and free speech and and, and Second Amendment and pro-life. And then they actually believe those things. And maybe that's why they ended up marrying the person they married, not because they've been ordered to do something. Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly inaccurate, too. In most of these competitive national races, women split, white women split fairly evenly. It was only in those couple in Texas and in Georgia where they weren't. And in Texas, they voted for Ted Cruz, a Hispanic man, over a white man, <laughs> Beto O'Rourke. So it's not as if, you know, they're just openly lying about that. On top of that, in Florida, DeSantis got 40 percent of Hispanics. Those facts are just absolutely sidelined uh, in service to the narrative. And they're still trying to... Uh finagle the win out of Rick Scott's hands in, in Florida. We'll see how much progress they make in that regard. I think the, they, they've still admitted that Ron DeSantis won the governor's race. So that'll be that'll be big news in your family at Thanksgiving and beyond. Uh, <laughs> oh, Gov- no. Stop confusing people, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get to our bonus martini now, because uh, if folks don't read Alexandra at National Review, shame on you. You really need to. She she covers a wide variety of issues and she does it very well. And, and one of the reasons she does it well is because she actually takes the time to go and talk to the people where they are. And that was the case in multiple Senate races, two in particular we're going to talk about here that flipped on Election Day. And that's North Dakota, where Kevin Kramer easily defeated Heidi Heitkamp. And then also in Indiana, where Mike Braun, I think surprisingly to a lot of people, easily defeated Joe Donnelly. Not that he won, but that he won by basically 10 points. Uh, So, Alexandra, you talked to both of these candidates. You've been on the ground in both of these states. Uh, Kavanaugh, obviously an issue here, but it's more than that. What did you learn about what the voters really wanted here? Well, I'm really glad, for one thing, that Heitkamp lost in North Dakota, because if she hadn't, I think I was going to have to give up elections reporting for good. I never would have trusted my instincts again. Uh, (laughs) Kramer, you know, North Dakota is a state that Trump won by 35 points in 2016. And when I was out there, it's just an obviously very Republican state. And the the liberal areas are concentrated in Fargo. And and other than that, it's just very conservative. And Heitkamp 
has voted for six years like a progressive. In the last two years, she's aligned herself a little bit more uh, with Trump. Um, but before that, she voted almost in lockstep with President Obama. So I think this election really came down to how well Kramer and his campaign would be able to highlight her uh, her voting record. And I think they did a good job. And Kramer's been in Congress as an at-large congressman now for North Dakota for the same amount of time as Hype Camp, which means uh, you know the entire state has already put him in office four times now. So he had, I think, a natural advantage the day he got into the race. I'm pretty sure that's, to me, that's the day Hyde Camp lost. Um, and then Indiana, obviously, this was a huge surprise. You know, I had, I saw tons of people kind of looking around, wondering who this Mike Braun character was because no one paid any attention to the Indiana Senate race. And I truly could not figure out why that was because Joe Donnelly was extremely vulnerable. Again, this is a state that Trump won by almost 20 points. Very Republican state. Mike Pence is from there. Uh, it didn't really matter who the Republican was. And, and Braun, to me, was the weakest of the three primary candidates. The other two were congressmen, um, but he they kind of cannibalized each other, I guess, in a sense, or can, cannibalized the vote, split the establishment vote, and Braun was able to win as an outsider. Uh, didn't even run the greatest campaign, honestly. I went out there and met him, and he's he kind of sounds like Trump. He's a, a better version of Trump, to my mind, has more uh, substantive policy ideas, um, but an outsider. And I think that appealed to people. And truly, the R next to his name was enough. Donnelly has basically done nothing. So if anyone out there listening is curious about Mike Brown, I've got a profile at National Review uh, for my time out in Jasper. You can learn a little more since the media just totally ignored him. What's your read on Indiana, Alexandra? Uh, readers know that you uh, went to college out there at a university that unfortunately has a very good football team this year. Uh, this is a state that went for Barack Obama in 2008, flipped back to Mitt Romney in 2012, and uh, it's been pretty lopsided now in the last two Senate races. So is uh, Indiana reasserting itself as a solidly red state? I think it is. And, you know, Obama won by about one point, I'm pretty sure, in 2008. And if you look at uh, the district where Mike Braun is from, Jasper in southwest Indiana, he was telling me when I was out there, this used to be solidly Democratic, you know, kind of either union or just sort of uh, blue collar Democrats. And the year that he was elected to the um, Indiana General Assembly, it went all Republican. Um, And so I think you're seeing kind of a shift, especially with Trump, this kind of rhetoric from the GOP coming out, appealing to people who used to be Democrats, now, the, the idea that they're welcome in the Republican Party and there's going to be kind of a different working class sort of um, contingent within the GOP. And, and they're hopeful, I think, that Trump is going to help them and Braun perhaps even more so than Trump. One thing I believe you mentioned in the story that you wrote, Alexandra, and it has also been reported elsewhere, is that at one time and not too long ago, uh, Mike Braun was a Democrat. So how conservative of a senator do you think he's going to be? He actually is really, really conservative. And this is something that was harped on a little bit in the primary was his Democratic voting record. Um, but he said essentially where he lived because it had been so democratic for so long. If you wanted to have any say in who your representative was going to be, you were going to have to vote Democrat. Um, but he said he's been a lifelong conservative. And at least from my time talking to him, it's pretty clear he, you know, most of his principles or his platform sound pretty solidly conservative. And he certainly is 100 percent pro-life from what I can tell, which is what I cared about the most. I'm hoping to do another interview with him and have more substantive longer piece on his uh, goals in the Senate. So look out for that. So you don't expect him to be uh, aligning with Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski on (laughs) anything uh, when it comes to Planned Parenthood (laughs) funding and things like that. So that's good. All right. Alexandra, great to have you with us today. We'll do it again tomorrow. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. Alexandra DeSanctis of National Review and for Jim Garrity today and on Friday as well. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Join us again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.